Good morning. Good morning. Um, before we get started, um, I am going to put a huge plug in for the uh, Passion Play up at Christian Life Center. This year it's called The War. Uh, a group of us from church went up yesterday and we saw it. It is incredible. Um, you know, I think sometimes we're so inundated with the concept of the cross and the sacrifice that sometimes we forget its meaning and its cost. And, and I think it's good to be reminded what it costs. Um, I do have some cards up here um, for the war. Um, it tells you when it will be playing. It plays again, uh, starts again this Wednesday at 7.30. So it goes Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 7.30 p.m. Uh, Saturday it's at 3 and 7.30. And then Sunday, which is Resurrection Sunday, it's at 8. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> 8 p.m. So if you'd like one of these cards, I've only got a few of them. Uh, I took half of the cards on the table, but I've only got a few left. So I would really encourage you. Um, and and I, I want to encourage you in two other things. One, go prepare. Bring Kleenex. Okay? Um, I know they're actors. I know that wasn't... Jesus, and it wasn't the disciples, but the, the idea of seeing my Savior on the cross for my sake. Um, that, was, that was heavy. And when he came out of the tomb, I wanted to jump and shout. <laughs> and I thought I'd be kicked out as a Pentecostal. <laughs> so, um, so, be prepared, get your heart ready, and bring Kleenex. Um, before we get into the message today, I was, uh, thankfully, I was corrected last week on something that I have missaid, and I'm going to blame it on uh, years and years of indoctrination and to replace <coughs> theology. Last week, I would refer to Jesus, we talked about Jesus' trek from Bethany all the way up to... Uh, Ephraim, and then back around to Bethany, to Jericho, and Bethany, and then Bethphage, and, and I kept referring to, he was going down to Jerusalem. That is inaccurate. You never go down to Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem. If you look on a map, uh, actually, would you go ahead and put the first slide up? I want to show you something that, that is really cool. Um, if you... Oh, I don't have my little pointer thingy. Hang on a second. I'm going to get my pointer thingy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, if you look at... I'm going to try and get out of everybody's way. If you look at Jerusalem, you'll notice that there's a valley on this side. This is the Hinnom Valley, Beth Hinnom. It's where we get the word Gehenna which is the, the word, the Hebrew word for hell, okay? And as compared to Sheol, which is the grave, that's where everybody goes when they die. But Gehenna is where those who are going to suffer go. Um, that's the Valley of Beth Hinnom. Uh, for those of you that have studied any in the Old Testament, this is where they would throw the altars when they tore down the Baal altars and the Asherah poles and the altars to Molech. They would throw them in here and then they would put refuse on them so that they could no longer be, be used. They were no longer holy. And so that, that idea, because that place, they would throw the refuse out there and then set it on fire, it, it kind of conveyed the same idea of what hell's gonna be like, the, the eternal fire, okay? But then if you look over, this is on the west side coming down, and then if you look over on the, the east side, you see the, the Kidron Valley, which is also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Um, you'll notice that you can't get to Jerusalem without going through a valley. You have to go up to get to Jerusalem. Always up. One other thing that I want you to see, uh, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God calls Jerusalem the place where he put his name. Okay? And we go, well, yeah, you know, I mean, that's where he had his temple, right? Yeah. But if you look, there's a third valley, 
right here, the Tyropian Valley. And if you look at the valleys, you have a, a letter, the Hebrew letter, looks kind of like a W, do you see it? Oh, wow. Okay. That's the Hebrew letter for Shin, which is the letter equivalent to God. So when God said, I put my name there, he stamped it. Boom. That's his name right there. Um, so it just, just kind of a cool thing. Another cool thing, if you look right here, they call that the footprint of God because it looks like a footprint. That's actually the city of David. So anyway, my correction, thank you, Dennis, for bringing that to my attention because we fall into habits of saying things, and a lot of times they're incorrect, so we want to be correct. You go up to Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> last week, we continued our journey. Jesus came down out of, not, not, not to Jerusalem, <laughs> came down out of Samaria, and he circled out toward the Jordan, came down to Jericho. At Jericho, he met Zacchaeus. Uh, at Jericho, he also healed Bartimaeus, the blind man. <clears throat> we talked about earlier that he had set his face toward Jerusalem. It, that's the fulfillment of the, the scripture uh, from the prophet, I believe it's Isaiah, that says uh, he will set his face as flint. Jesus knew it was coming. He knew it was time. He set his eyes toward Jerusalem. He set his gazed toward Jerusalem, and he set out. He was not going to be stopped. But on the way, he stopped in Jericho to meet with Zacchaeus. And on his way out of Jericho, uh, there's a blind man sitting by the road that calls out to him, son of David, have mercy on me. And they tell him, dude, shut up. He's busy. He's got stuff to do. And if that were most of us, we'd probably go, oh, jeez, sorry, wow. You know, but, but Bartimaeus didn't, did he? No, it says he shouted even louder. Like that. We worked on that. <clears throat> he shouted even louder until he got Jesus' attention. And Jesus said, what do you want? He said, I want to see. And Jesus, and this is cool. This is, you, know, you know when Jesus healed the blind man, he did it different ways. Okay, sometimes he just spoke. Uh, one time he actually made mud and put it on the guy's eyes. Uh, but but, but uh, I love the idea because he reached out and he touched him. We have a God that touches us. Okay? He's not distant. He's not out there somewhere minding his own affairs or keeping an eagle eye on us so he can smite us when we fail. No, we have a God that touches us. And, and Bartimaeus was healed. And then he goes, <clears throat> if you look on our map, you'll see that uh, Bethany is right over here in the corner. Okay, Jericho whoop, would be way over here. And so he goes to Bethany and he stays at the house with uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The Lazarus who had been raised from the dead. Um, you know, scripture says that when Jesus uh, came, when, when Lazarus was sick, he had, he had passed away. And he, Jesus has waited for four days before he came. And then when he was walking toward the tomb, seeing the distress of the people, it says Jesus wept. Okay? And I'm not really convinced that Jesus was weeping for the same reason the other people were weeping. I think Jesus was going to do something that wasn't necessarily a good thing for Lazarus. Because he was going to raise him from the dead. And, you know, you think, oh, everything's great, everything's marvelous, we've got him back. Um... You know, Lazarus would have been at this point in the bosom of Abraham, uh, not yet heaven, but um, when Jesus comes back to Bethany, a large crowd of people start coming in. Man, this is a guy that rose, raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, we got to go see him. We got to hear what he says. We got to see miracles. We want to see him. We want to see him. We want to hear. We want to know. <clears throat> and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, didn't like it. They, they didn't like it. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> If you look a couple chapters earlier in the story, uh, we find that the Pharisees, had, or the, the, all, all, the religious leaders, we tend to say Pharisees all the time, but the, all the religious leaders were involved. Sadducees, Pharisees, 
the, the Herodians. It didn't matter. Um, they had already determined that Jesus was going to die. As a matter of fact, Caiaphas, the high priest that year, proclaimed a prophetic utterance when he said it is better for one man to die mm -hmm. than the entire nation. And, and that was exactly what was coming to pass. So they had already determined they're looking for a way to kill Jesus. But now, because Lazarus has been raised from the dead and all of these people hear this miracle and all these people know he was dead, you know, you don't chill in a grave for four days for fun. And he came out. So now the religious leaders, they add Lazarus to the hit list. Because when they see all the people coming to hear Jesus, Scripture says that they determined that they must kill Lazarus. Okay? I think Jesus was weeping because he knew that, that you know, people are looking for a sign, but the, the sign they're looking for isn't the one that they're understanding. When we were at the, the play yesterday, I was struck by a thought that I'd never had before <clears throat> that happens occasionally. And... Uh, Jesus had come into <clears throat> the crowd, and, and this crowd had been milling around on stage, and, and you could see um, there was a, a little boy that was lame, uh, there was a leper, and there was a blind woman. And as Jesus is going through the crowd, um, he's healing the people, he's touching them. And he, he went to the leper, and the leper is wrapped up in robes, and uh, lepers had to proclaim themselves. They were not allowed into the community. They had to dwell outside of the community. And they had to proclaim that they were a leper so that people would have warning and get out of their way. So um, lepers were uh, the social outcasts. Okay. Um, Jesus touched the leper. And, and in the, the story, I mean, you read in the scripture, that's one of the most amazing things about it. One of the earliest miracles that he did in Matthew was to heal the leper. And it says he touched him. Okay, now this is huge for two reasons. One, because the religious code said that if, if you touched someone with leprosy, and she's an example, she's not a leper. <laughs> You're not a leper, right? <laughs> okay. Jesus touched him. But Jesus, it says he touched him and he, the, the, the religious law, he would have been unclean. He would have to go ritually cleanse himself, okay? But there's also the stigmata of, of the stigmatism of, of touching a leper. Talk about cooties. I mean, this is like cooties on steroids. But this is a man who had not been touched by anyone other than a leper. It's a chorus. From the time he was diagnosed to this point. Matter of fact, there was such a stigma against leprosy that if you sat on a chair that a leper sat on, you were unclean and you had to go cleanse yourself. Okay? And Jesus touched him. And so while we're watching this musical and, and the leper is coming up on the stage and Jesus walks up to him and he touches him. And the, the, that, the thought that came to me is that we're all the leper. Because before Christ purified us, before he washed us, before he cleansed us, we were rotten. We were falling apart. We were, I mean, as, as much as the Jews despised the leprosy, God despised our sin more. And then I started carrying that thought through. You know, there's not one that Jesus didn't heal that isn't us. Because we were all blind. Amen. We were all deaf. We were all mute. We could not speak forth the glories of God until His Spirit came into us. And we were all dead. And He raised us from death to life. And, and that just was an astounding thing to me. Um, <clears throat> you know, before we left our house, Christy grabbed a bunch of Kleenex. Well, I, last time I was at the Passion Play was 19, I think it was 1994. I haven't been since. <clears throat> I knew what to expect, but I was not prepared for how much it touched me this time. Um, <clears throat> so, we're the leper. And God touched us. And his spirit dwells within us. And, and, and he makes us whiter than snow. So, 
<clears throat> let's, let's get into the final phase of our journey here. <clears throat> so, we left last week with Jesus at Bethphage. You can see it up on the map there. That was considered a day's, a Sabbath day's journey from the temple. He stops at Bethphage and he does something kind of weird. They're getting ready for Passover. Does anybody know what day this is on the Hebrew calendar where he stops at Bethphage? Okay, go back to our teaching on the Passover. And let's actually, if you would, turn with me to uh, Exodus <clears throat> chapter 12. Okay, so in Exodus chapter 12, we see the Passover, okay? And we read in Scripture, Scripture, there is nothing in Scripture that is not in there without a purpose. Everything has a purpose in there. Sometimes we don't understand the purpose, sometimes we don't see the purpose, but everything is in there with a reason, okay? So, uh, chapter 12, I'm going to pick up. Well, let's just start in verse 1. I'm just going to read a few verses here. It says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. So the, the back story is God has sent Moses and Aaron to go speak to Pharaoh to deliver Israel out of his hand and take them to the land that God had promised him. Promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He, he foretold this. And then we see the, the whole thing with the plagues and Pharaoh says, oh, stop the plague and I'll let you go. And then the plague stops and he's like, I ain't letting you go. And back and forth and back and forth, okay. So in, in chapter 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month, does anybody know what month they're in? Nisan. 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 Avi. Okay. This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Then verse, or verse 3, this is where I want you to start paying attention. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to his father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. The lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you will keep it until the 14th day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Okay, and then the, the story goes on, and, and we have the institution of the Passover. Okay, now the Passover was one of the most significant days in Israel as far as their festivals, but it was probably the most significant day for them as a nation <clears throat> because up to this point, they were not a nation. Up to this point, they were a people group. They didn't have their own laws. They didn't have their own king. They didn't have their own currency. They were slaves in Egypt. They were a people group. They were a group under themselves that were different from the Egyptians, but they, they didn't have their own government, they didn't have self-rule, they, they were subject to whatever Egypt said. And so, um, God, who sent them to Egypt via Joseph, is going to take them out of Egypt, and he's going to make of them a nation. All right? Now, think about this for a minute. Um, the first five books of the Bible, the, the, the Torah, um, these are the books of law. And we have Genesis, which is mostly history. <clears throat> Exodus, which is mostly history. And then we get into Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers. And we see God presenting to these people a list of laws. A list of, of ways in which they will govern themselves as his people. <clears throat> now we look at this and we go, Boring! Oh my gosh! I don't care how many generations of these people there were and how many there were in each generation and how many were males. 
I really, I don't care. It has no impact on me. It does have an impact on you, we just don't see it. <clears throat> First, God is creating from scratch a nation. And a nation has to have rules by which it can be governed. We talked last week a little bit about the different laws that God put into effect. He put in civil laws. He put in moral laws. He put in religious laws. We, he put in what I call the laws of peculiarity. Okay? God made for himself a unique people, and he said, here, boom! This is how you will be. Okay? So when you're going through your Bible and, and, and you really want to skip over these things, don't skip over them. Slow down. Slow down. Take a look. When they're listing off name after name after name after name, and half of them you can't even pronounce, pay attention to those names because those names are in there for a purpose. A lot of times those names are in there because they relate to the story somehow in a different place. All right? So, so pay attention to those things. Um, so God institutes the Passover. Now, you notice that he said on the 10th, you will select a lamb. And then he gave them, you know, if, depending on how many people are in your family, you, you either get a lamb for yourself or, or maybe you go in with a neighbor and get a lamb or, or you might even need to get several lambs depending on how many people are there because you need to eat the lamb. And, but on the 10th, that's the day you select the lamb. All right? And, and it can be either a, a, from the sheep or the goats. And, and then you hold them for four days. Not like physically hold them, but you keep them for four days. Um, these four days were known as the days of inspection, okay? Because the lamb was to be without blemish. So for four days, you would examine the lamb and make sure that it was without blemish. Now, as we get later in the story, because right now, there, this is the first Passover, okay? And later, uh, as we see in Leviticus 23, God ordains for them that this will be one of their, their festivals, one of their feasts, one of God's... Um, <clears throat> appointed times. So, God establishes this. Later we find that this is going to be a yearly occurrence. They're going to do this every year. Every year, on the 10th day of the first month, they are going to select a lamb and take it to their home, and then they're going to inspect it for four days. All right. Now, when Jesus comes up to Bethphage, he tells the disciples, he sends them forward into Jerusalem, and he says, go and, well, some people say Jerusalem, some say it was in Bethphage, I, I, I don't know. But I know they went forward, uh, because they followed a man carrying a jug of water. And, and then they hijacked, they borrowed his transportation. Um, so uh, go ahead and, and flip to the next. This is from our trip to Israel. And... The place that we're standing there is thought to be, traditionally, is thought to be the place where Jesus first came into view of Jerusalem. You'll read in the different testament, or the different uh, gospels, um, you'll see that as, the, as they came up to this point, they were quiet, but when they got to this point, when they came into view of the temple, when they came into the view of Jerusalem, they started shouting and they started singing, you know. So Jesus is brought the donkey. Go ahead and go to the next picture there. A donkey. Now, you go, uh, okay, why, why a donkey? Well, there's a couple of reasons for a donkey. Donkeys are, are sure-footed. They, they don't stumble nearly as often as horses do. I don't know why that is. Probably God gave them a penny because they weren't going to race because they got that weird voice <laughs> and big ears. I don't know, but they're sure-footed, okay? Um, they brought him a donkey. This was an a, a Arab gentleman when we were there um, that was offering, that he called it his taxi. <laughs> and you could get a ride in his taxi. And so uh, we're at the start of, of where they think, we don't know for sure, um, they think that, that Jesus probably started coming down to Jerusalem and, and the people started shouting and they started <clears throat> taking the palm branches and throwing them down before him. Um, now, uh, go ahead. I'm just going to show, show you these slides really quickly. Go ahead and go forward. Okay, looking out over, 
Um, it's kind of hard to see. I tried to get it bigger. This is the Dome of the Rock where, where we believe that the temple would have stood right here. Okay? And right here, this is the Eastern Gate, the Golden Gate. This is where uh, the Messiah would come into Jerusalem. Now, back during the, the time when the Muslims wiped everything out, Saladin, who was one of the great leaders of the, the Muslims, uh, he was aware of the prophecies about the Messiah coming in the Eastern Gate. And so he, he go ahead and go to a, a, another picture real quick. Um, this is just the road as we're walking down. Again, they think this was probably very close to where Jesus walked. I just wanted you to get a feel for what it was like. Go ahead and go again. Okay, so here's the eastern gate right here. You notice there's no gates? <laughs> Saladin thought he was going to trump God's prophecy. He said, well, if I wall it up, he can't get in. But, beyond, but more than that, I mean, look, look all around here. Uh, go back to the two pictures back real quick. Right here. <coughs> you see what these are? What? Graves. graves. Those are graves. Now, these are Jewish graves. As a matter of fact, it's in this cemetery that, uh, oh, Mon I think that's where Menachem Begin is, is buried in. Um, and it's on the eastern or the western face of Mount of Olives because they said that Jesus, the Messiah, will appear on the top of Mount Olives. They want to be as close to him as they can when he comes back when they're raised to life. Okay? Uh, unless they're Sadducees, they're stuck. Right. Okay, and then go ahead and go forward. Um, so not only did he wall it up, and it's kind of silly really because that's not actually where the gates were. They're actually underneath here because remember when Jerusalem fell, the walls were raised. Uh, so they built new walls on top. So the actual gates are underneath. But Saladin, uh, he also was aware of, of Jewish custom, Jewish law. And he knew that if you went through a graveyard, you were unclean and you couldn't go to the temple without going and getting cleansed. So he thought, aha, not only am I going to wall this up, I'm going to stick bodies in there. So there are, there are actually tombs inside the wall. But not only that, we're, we're not just going to make it hard for him to get in, impossible to come through the wall. We're going to make it impossible for him to even approach. All of these are Muslim graves. He can't even walk up to the gate to come through. We're going to prevent all of this. <laughs> right. A couple things that he failed to understand. First, um, God does what he wants. Second, uh, when it says that the Messiah is going to come, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to split it in two, from east to west. So imagine... This being, because we're on the Mount of Olives here, split into boop, 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 and everything moves that way and that way. And the gates underneath are opened up and revealed. I don't think it's going to be a problem. Really, I don't. I think the Muslims are going to go, uh-oh. All right? So go ahead and go on to the next one. Uh, there's just a couple more. This is the Church of the Tear. It's a Catholic church, and this is. I wanted to show you this because I want to talk to you about a particular passage telling about the triumphal entry. Um, this is where the Catholics believe that Jesus wept as he came down the Mount of Olives and, and he was crying out. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But I wanted to point that out to you because you notice that the, the, the church is kind of in the shape of a teardrop. That, that's where they believe that Jesus uh, was crying. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. <clears throat> that's it. Okay. Um, so we have the Passover we have the rules uh, let's go over to Luke if you would Luke chapter 19 uh, verse 28 we're not going to read here I'm going to go down a little bit further but verse 28 is where we, we, we left our story last week. He's at Bethany. He sends, he sends the disciples forward to go get the donkey. Um, you know, um, 
you gotta you gotta have a, a little bit of respect for the owner of the donkey because you know if somebody showed up at your house and climbed in your car and started to drive off and you said hey what are you doing with my car and they gave you the answer the master said he needs it <laughs> and you went oh okay cool <laughs> far out it's full of gas you know because um, that's what happened I mean this is this guy's transportation and and so uh, they bring the donkey back to Jesus uh, so down in verse 35 um, verse 34 they said the Lord has need of it and then 35 and they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt they set Jesus upon it and as he rode along they spread their cloaks on the road as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he, they had seen saying blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Okay. 39, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, being Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, This is a fulfillment of a couple of prophecies. On the front of your bulletin, um, we use Zechariah 9.9. 9. Uh, this is a prophecy from Zechariah. Uh, I'll read it for you. You don't have to turn there. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Uh, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay? Now, we need to look at a little history to understand some of the things that are happening here. Uh, about 332 B.C., um, Alexander the Great had just conquered Tyre, fulfilling prophecy, by the way, because God told Tyre that it was going to be sacked. And they, they thought they, they existed in their pride because their city, their entire city was on an island off of the mainland. And the only way to get across is either by a bridge or by boat. And when Alexander comes around the Mediterranean and he's heading toward them, they burn the bridge. Aha! He'll never get us now! And, and they could still resupply because they had harbors in their city. So they could send ships out and bring ships in. And, and, and there was really not a good way to starve them out. So they sit up and they're, they're like, do you guys ever see uh, the, the uh, Monty Python's The Holy Grail? Yes. The French taunter? You know, go away, you English knigots. And they were talking, that's what they were doing. They're standing up in their tower going, ah, you foolish Macedonians. You know, you can't touch us. Na, 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 na. So Alexander built a bridge <laughs> out of earth. And he took it out, boom, 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 all the way to the island. And they went, uh-oh. And Alexander sat fire, fulfilling prophecy. So Alexander takes it down, and then he comes around, and he's headed to Egypt, because Egypt is the next power. <laughs> Well, on the way from Tyre to Egypt, there's this little country, boom, Israel. And, and in Israel, Israel is being ruled at this point by the high priest. And he comes down and the high priest goes, <laughs> we don't want none of that. I think the high priest knew he was fulfilling prophecy. And, and I think he said, you know, hey, hey, we, here's the keys. Take the keys to the city. And so uh, Alexander didn't sack Jerusalem because they didn't put up a fight. They, they surrendered to him. Okay? So um, jumping forward a number of years, uh, because Daniel prophesies about Alexander, or, yeah, Alexander, and, and he prophesied that he was going to come out of the west and he was going to destroy the great ram in the east, which was Persia. And then his horn was going to be broken off and four horns would come up in its place. Well, Alexander died um, still at a, a very young age, and his empire was divided up amongst his four generals into four different kingdoms. Okay, we only need to, to be concerned with two of them. Uh, the Seleucid kingdom, which was 
uh, kind of the area that is Iraq and, and Syria and Lebanon, and then the Ptolemy uh, kingdom, which was Egypt, and up into Israel and, and Gaza and that area. Okay, now going forward a little bit, uh, according to Daniel's prophecy, the king of the north and the king of the south would fight back and forth and back and forth. And, and the king of the north would be triumphant. Well, we get to the point about 160, 150 BC, and um, the king of the Seleucids is Antiochus, who gave himself the name Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. He, he said, not only am I the king, I'm a god. Okay, so it's Epiphanes. Um, he, at this point, conquers Israel and, and takes it away from the Ptolemies. All right? And um, he is rabidly anti-Jewish. He institutes some policies that, that um, you're not allowed to circumcise your boys. If you're circumcised, uh, the mother... Uh, they kill the child and hang it around the mother's neck and she has to carry the dead child around for days until at the end of that time she's killed. Um, you're not allowed to uh, make sacrifices in the temple. He actually brought a pig in and sacrificed it on the bronze altar. Uh, the the uh, desecration that causes desolation, the abomination which causes desolation. Um, he, he did a number of things and one of the things that, that happened is uh, there was a priest who refused to make sacrifice and he killed uh, starting an uprising, the Maccabean revolt. Maccabee um, is Hammerhand. That was his son's name. Uh, they gave him the title Hammerhand. Uh, he had five sons. The Maccabean revolt took place. They overthrew Antiochus. And, and, and you know, God's story goes on even when we don't have writings about it. They, this is the intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew. And, and Israel delivers themselves of the, the, the Seleucids, the Greeks, and then we see the whole setup for the Romans coming in and bringing us to the place where Jesus is. I tell you this because you have to understand what's happening. When Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives, it says not only were there a great multitude following him, all of the people from Jericho who saw what he did are following with him. People in, in Jerusalem are coming out to meet him. And they're shouting, and they're dancing, and they're celebrating. They're saying, Yashana, which we say, Hosanna. And, and it means, deliver us, okay? Set us free. And, and they're, they're taking the palm branches, and they're, they're waving them, and they're throwing them in front of his feet. They're putting their coats down in front of his feet. And, and we look at this as this, wow, this is great. This is awesome. Isn't it? everything amazing? Except for a couple things. One, we have no clue what is going on. Okay? We want to interpret it in our, our distinctly Western thinking, and we go, hey, it's a parade! <laughs> Yay! Where's the floats? <laughs> okay? And, and, but see, they're singing. So as they come down the Mount of Olives, and they're, they're coming up to Jerusalem, they're singing, and usually it's the, 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 the Psalms, and they're, they're singing and rejoicing. And, but see, there's something else going on, because the, the palm branch is significant. You notice that the, the scripture is specific. It says they put palm branches down, not just branches. It's significant because the palm branch <laughs> is the symbol of the Hasmonean dynasty, the Maccabees, the ones that rebelled and overthrew the Greeks. And when they're waving these things, that's like us waving our flag. Okay, this, this identifies them as a people, and it not only does that, it identifies them as a people that are, are not going to be ruled over. We look at some of the, the Roman writings. Boy, I tell you, when you got sent to Jerusalem and you got sent to Israel, that was not a promotion. That was a horrible thing. As a matter of fact, Pilate was in Jerusalem as a result for backing the wrong guy for king. His candidate lost. The new guy sent him to Jerusalem because he knew he was going to blow it there. Okay? The Romans called them, they're a fractious people. Their own God calls them stiff necked and hard headed. Boy, was he right. Okay? So, prophecy says that, that the Messiah is going to come down the Mount of Olives and he's going to come on Lamb Selection Day. So, every Lamb Selection Day, all eyes turn. Woo! 
There's the Mount of Olives. Is that him? That him? Oh, whoa, whoa. we know from antiquity, um, um, Josephus' antiquities, that it was on this day that, that men that believed themselves to be Messiah, that had gathered followers to them, they would intentionally come down the Mount of Olives on this day so that people would go, oh, this might be the Messiah. Well, guess what? The Romans picked up on that. Because all of a sudden, hey man, it's just every day this year. It's about this time. All these weirdos come down off this mountain and they're stalking rebellion and they want to overthrow us. And, and so what do they do? They started bringing, you know, they beefed up their forces around this time. We know that just a couple years before this, one of the men had proclaimed himself Messiah. He brought his army down. He's going to go into Jerusalem. He started protesting. They started rioting. And 400 people were slaughtered by the Romans to restore peace. Okay? So we know historically that on this day, the Messiah, those proclaiming the Messiah, would come down the Mount of Olives to go in on Lamb Selection Day. Now Jesus comes down and he weeps. Jesus isn't doing this thing. You know, he's not the diva going, oh, they love me. Oh, I'm so good. Look at them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what he's doing. Okay? And we look, I mean, all, almost all of the videos that I've ever seen, all the movies that I've ever seen about the triumphal entry, it, it's like sometimes he's somber, but, but other times he's like, yeah, you know, hey, we're doing this thing. And, but, but Scripture says that he wept. As a matter of fact, the word that they use for wept um, it, it carries the idea of every kind of external exclamation of mourning, wailing, crying, tears, bereft. So he's coming down, they're all cheering for him, and he's crying. Who elected this guy? You know? And he's coming in, and he's coming on Lamb Selection Day. Now they knew that the connection is that the Messiah was going to come in, but they didn't understand why that day was significant. Because Jesus comes in on the day when the lambs are being driven into Jerusalem to be selected. And they take him, and for the next four days, the lamb is inspected. And we see that over the next four days, every day Jesus was in Jerusalem. He was in the temple courts. He was being questioned by the Pharisees. He was being questioned by the Sadducees. He was being questioned by the Herodians. He was offering himself up to be inspected. And he answered every question flawlessly with the exception of one. Do you know what the question was? Hmm? By whose authority and whose power do you do these things? He says, well, I'll answer your question if you can answer my question. Whose authority did John do these things? <laughs> you know, if, if we say God, then he's going to say, why didn't you believe it? That's not good, because we're going to look stupid. Or if we say it's from man, I mean, these people think he was from God. And if we say he's from man, we're going to get, you know, I don't like rocks pelting my head. I know. Let's take the safe road. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. I don't know. Jesus said, well, then neither will I tell you my answer. Okay? So, so he ins he's offering himself up for inspection. The time is building. The climax is coming. All of this stuff is building up and pressure is mounting. The, the, the kingdom of hell, hang on just a sec, is, is pushing and pushing and pushing because they can see the end for what they think is the end. They put all the pieces in place. Judas has agreed to betray him. The religious leaders, they're all set against him. They've got the, the, the pilot stuck in a bad place because he's already on the outs with Caesar. And when they bring Jesus to him, they're going to say, if you support this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Uh oh, that's going to get him in hot water with the big guy. All right? Everything is in place. Everything is in place. We just need the right time. The right time. So Jesus comes down the mountain. He's riding a donkey to fulfill scripture, Zechariah 9 9. The, the king would approach a city in one of two ways. One of two ways. If he came riding on a donkey, he was coming in peace and everything's copacetic. He comes riding on a horse. He's prepared for battle. He's prepared for war. And you better be checking yourself. Jesus came, meek and lowly, riding on a donkey. He was coming in peace. And they're celebrating, and they don't understand what he's about. 
They don't understand why he's there. And he stops and he sees everything that's going to happen because he knows in four days these very same people that are cheering and shouting and waving these palm branches, they're, they're loving him, they're, they're all into him. These same people are going to be waving their fists and they're going to be shouting, crucify him. Crucify him. And he looks and he sees. Now, I, I don't think he was weeping for himself. Mm -hmm. I think he was weeping for them because he said, if, if you had known the day of your visitation, if you had known this was the day. And then he speaks a, a prophecy. He tells them, you know, it's not even going to be a few years and, and all of this is going to be gone. All the walls are going to be torn down. The temple is going to be destroyed. You are going to be slaughtered. And he's weeping for his children. He's weeping for the things that they brought on themselves. That if they could have just opened their eyes and seen all of this would have been spared. But that wasn't the plan. That wasn't the plan. Father, we bless you today and we thank you. Because you had a plan. That, Father, we might be free. That, Father, we might be healed of all of the, the, the leprosy, the blindness, the deafness. Father, that you would bring us back from death to life. We thank you, Father, that Jesus looked, he counted the cost, and he found it to be a, a, a bargain, his life for ours. He chose, he looked beyond the cross, scorning its shame, and he took our place. And we thank you, and we, we bless you today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh,